I would like to thank you for joining on our panel today, The Voice of Youth. Today we have gathered some of our amazing speakers, young people from different culture, cultures, different countries, different educational backgrounds and different professions. And all of them will share their perspective on how education in their field of interest can be improved and contribute to human security. Our first speaker today is Hamza Nasiri, Junior Cybersecurity Consultant, Future Sustainability Leader. So Hamza, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much. First of all, uh, World Academy, I um, feel very honored to be among all of you guys today for this talk. Um, so first, I'm going to be answering one question. What is the link between cybersecurity and human security? So you have to understand that we live in a digital world where everything is interconnected. Anything we do in favor of human security needs to be enforced and resilient to cyber attacks. Furthermore, each SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, includes a digital component. Some does more than others, but overall, we need to, um, uh, we, we really need um, to achieve the 17 SDGs, uh, cyber peace and uh, capacity building for cyber resilient development. And cyber security threats have the potential to impact human security in so many ways. And just to give you an example, we we're talking about viruses that could take over uh, control of the whole uh, nuclear power plant. This was the case in 2010 with the Stuxnet virus. It was a virus that has the capacity to auto-update itself. And, uh, and uh, with, uh, with the time, it, it became able to um, take control of certain parameters of uh, the, some uh, Iranian nuclear power plants. Um, we are also talking about uh, cyber warfare. Uh, the possibility to disrupt uh, governments. Uh, it was the case that for during the three last months with uh, uh, the UK military, uh, Estonian, uh, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, Belgian. And this is just 1% uh, of what happened over the three last months. So this is a really serious matter to take in consideration. And finally, we're talking about destroyed lives because of stolen information that belongs to Mr. Nobody that just got scammed or um, hacked or blackmailed or... So just today, as a matter of today, we received a, uh, an alert that a ransomware was targeting um, uh, Moroccan companies. It's called the Skull Locker Ransomware. And this happened like just today, a ransomware is a virus that uh, encrypts all of your data and um, until you pay a ransom. So in summary, cybersecurity threats have the potential to undermine human security by compromising physical, economic, social, and political well-being. Therefore, it is essential to address cybersecurity threats as part of the broader framework of human security to ensure the protection of individuals and communities from harm. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how can simply cybersecurity make a significant change in education for human security. So first of all, um, we need to promote safe and secure use of technology and protect individuals' privacy and personal data. So there are two points here. First, uh, cybersecurity education. Uh, or fight against digital literacy. Everything is dig digitalized nowadays, and very few people uh, know the threats that they are facing in their daily life whenever they, they are opening uh, their laptop to conduct their business or working inside a company. And we really need to understand the importance of getting uh, knowledge about how technology works, uh, how to use it safely and securely, uh, responsible use of uh, so social media, avoiding cyberbullying, and using technology to promote positive change. And about social networks, I have, uh, I think, I think that it is uh, a responsibility that belongs to the serv service providers. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, social networks like uh, Instagram or Facebook. They should maybe make uh, short videos to show the kind of threats that people might be facing in their daily life. 
uh, the current uh, scams that are occurring. Um, for example, there is an attack that is called a phishing attempt. So a phishing is a form of social engineering where attackers uh, deceive people into revealing uh, sensitive information or installing a malicious program in their computer uh, that they might exploit later. And just to give you some figures here, 98% uh, of emails containing a crypto wallet address are phishing. And the average annual cost for phishing is $14.8 million. So this is a really serious matter. Now, the second point is data protection and privacy. With the increasing amount of personal data being collected and stored online, it's important for individuals to understand how to protect their personal information. And I think, um, uh, again, service providers uh, should be the ones addressing uh, this concern. And education for human security and cybersecurity could include teaching people how to use uh, secure passwords, for example, how to identify and avoid scams, uh, how to use privacy settings on social media and other platforms. And um, so this is uh, really important. In conclusion, I'm just going to say that cybersecurity can play a role in education for human security by promoting safe and secure use of technology. It involves protecting uh, data, preventing cyber bullying and harassment, and protecting critical infrastructures as well uh, by ensuring that everyone around, uh, around the world uh, have the knowledge and tools they need to stay safe online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamza, on your amazing speech and for teaching us something new. Our next speaker is Tamara Stojkovic, Youth Delegate of the Republic of Serbia to the UN and co-founder of Zajednički Frižider. Tamara, could you please tell us, would the education gap still persist in the absence of global disruption and how can we make sure that education is prioritized as a fundamental right and a key driver of sustainable development? Tamara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dora, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be uh, here today with you um, and address you the underlying issues in the education gap, which, are, which is caused by the global disruptions we are facing. As we know, the pandemic uh, has highlighted and exacerbated the existing inequalities uh, in access to quality education, especially for marginalized and vulnerable groups. However, uh, the education gap is not only a result of the pandemic, but also of other global disruptions such as conflict, natural disasters, economic crisis, technological challenges, and so on. And therefore, we need to address the underlying issues that perpetuate this educational gap even after uh, the current crises are over. Um, the obvious one is poverty. So children from poor families are more likely to drop out of school or not attend it at all uh, due to the lack of resources, food, food healthcare, support uh, in general. And they may also have to work or care for family members, which limits their time and energy for learning. Uh, so we need to tackle poverty and all the challenges related to it, such as inequality, unemployment, uh, social exclusion, through multidimensional approach that involves not only education, but also health, social protection, and other economic opportunities. Uh, this uh, requires collaboration among governments, civil society, private sector, and international organizations, of course, to de design and implement those strategies that can address the root causes. Uh, of course, um, connected to it is the discriminations and stereotypes. Uh, so children from minority groups face multiple barriers to access uh, quality education and succeed in it. And they may encounter hostile environments, biased curricula, inadequate support services, and etc. Uh, so we need to promote diversity, equality, and inclusion in educational systems uh, that requires a transformative, transformative approach that challenges the status quo and promotes critical thinking and fosters 
the intercultural dialogue um, and we should face that, that discrimination and not separate separate those from marginalized group uh, in order to avoid it. For example, separating uh, immigrant children in special schools so they can avoid the, the criticism and the hostile environment they may face. Um, and of course, inadequate funding and infrastructure is uh, is a big problem since education uh, may come at the, the last uh, thing on the list uh, when it comes to budgeting in many countries, especially low-income ones. Uh, so the pandemic has disrupted this uh, educational system even more, uh, and uh, it caused a learning crisis that requires additional investments and innovative, uh, innovative projects to address it. So we need to prioritize education as a fundamental human right and a key driver of sustainable development and invest in it accordingly. Uh, that requires not only more public funding, but also more effective and efficient use of existing resources um, through monitoring and evalu evaluation uh, and, of course, public-private partnerships. Uh, it also requires investing in the capacity and professionalism of teachers, uh, school leaders, educational uh, officials, uh, which are the backbone of education system, which is constantly changing and we have uh, new technologies coming in. So it's important to, um, to keep track of, of them. Uh, and when it comes to solutions to all of these pro uh, problems, I already mentioned uh, some of the, the things I consider as solutions. But uh, in overall, we must commit to improving access, quality, equity, and inclusion for the 222 million children and youth whose education have been interrupted or who are not learning at all due to armed conflict, display, displacement, uh, internally and across the borders, and health and or climate-induced uh, disasters. Uh, it requires a systematic and holistic approach that tackles poverty, discrimination, and underinvestment, uh, like we said. And so education is not only a mean to overcome those crises we mentioned, but also a path to a brighter future where knowledge, skills, and values are the currency of progress and prosperity. Thank you all so much for your attention and I wish you all a fruitful conference. Thank you, Tamara, for your amazing speech. Now we are moving to the next speaker, Ivana Lazarovsky, Junior Fellow of World Academy of Art and Science. Ivana, what do you find to be the main challenge in establishing the concept of human security? The floor is yours. What I see to be uh, one of the, the, the main obstacles to the establishing uh, of the concept of uh, the human security is a role of identity. Um, and I want to talk about the role uh, of identity in building up the concept of human security and how can education uh, contribute to the genuine shift in the perception of the concept uh, of security. So first of all, to say that in the core of a human security concept lays the question of identity and it, it presents the most challenging obstacle uh, to accept and genuinely uh, naturalize uh, human security as a concept. As long as we perceive a different uh, other in a negative way, based on the negative stereotypes, um, it's very difficult to unite in our common goals and, and, and uh, to unite in uh, our future perspectives. Um, so I also have, want to point out a very important uh, problem, that uh, significant problem arising uh, from the relationship in between the identity and the access to education. Um, all sorts of identities, including the gender identity, race identity, nationality. Um, so taking uh, an example, certainly not the only example, but maybe most the, the most radical one, the example of Afghanistan, where 80% of uh, school-aged girls and young women are without access to a formal education, and 30% of them have never entered the primary uh, education. 
for me, in concrete, uh, this uh, is a clear example of, of, a, of a threat to a country, to a whole nation. And uh, so in particular, Angani Afghanistan in this example is uh, risking to lose the generation uh, of women, which are essential part of the development of the whole uh, society. Uh, not to say that they are 49, they represent the 49% of the population of Afghanistan. So uh, what do I see and uh, how can education contribute to, the, to this shift? Well, I am trying to propose, um, I see the education to be one of the strongest catalysts of the social transformation in general. So um, I propose a multidisciplinary approach that will be uh, able, first of all, uh, in cooperation with the, with the historians, with the human rights, international human rights experts, uh, with psychologists, with sociologists and anthropologists to target the root causes of negative stereotypes of different groups that stand in between the education and progress for different groups and the whole nation in general. And uh, I propose that, um, yes, the education for liberation of this uh, negative uh, perception of different other that will naturally lead us towards uh, the concept of human, human security, which is in, in itself a security for everyone and from everyone. Um, this education also plays a significant role in the, in the, in the countries that are facing the problem of the mid-income mid uh, economy trap, uh, which can in the long term degradate uh, many generations uh, that will be just um, happy with, uh, with the mid-income and the uh, lower or mid-skill uh, working class. Uh, so it is essential part uh, of, uh, of this progress is actually access to education. Uh, so I just want to raise this very important and maybe the, the major uh, obstacle to access to education and furthermore to uh, access uh, to the, the acceptance of the concept of human security, which is the, the problem of identity and the wrong perception of a different other. Um, so that's what I want to contribute. Thank you, Ivana, for this insightful speech. Our next speaker is Ashley Kamau, future sustainability leader. So Ashley, could you please tell us how does education affect global security and how can we promote quality education more universally? Thank you. So first of all, I'm gonna, uh, my topic is going to touch up on what Tamara and Ivana have said. Um, first, I need to define what human security is. And I found the best definition was by the, the former prime minister of Japan, Ochubi Keizu, said that it's comprehensively seizing all of the menaces that threaten the survival, daily life, and dignity of human beings, and for strengthening the efforts that confront these threats. So I looked at education. I, come, I am from Kenya, a very small village here in Kenya, and uh, education has always been an issue in the country. So first, uh, when you look at education, education is uh, the basis of understanding all the values that we share. So this, it depends on three things. There's uh, quality, there's accessibility, and there's equity. Most people usually say that equity um, and accessibility are a prerequisite to quality, but I think it's the opposite. Um, this is because if you look at quality, in 2015, it was reported that a total of 615 million children worldwide did not have the basic literacy and numeracy skills, yet they attended schools. Now, this is even worse in my country in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's 88% of school children do not have basic numeracy skills and 84 do not have mathematical skills. Now, when we look at quality, why, why are these statistics like this? I would attribute it to th two things, the who and what. The who are the parents, the teachers, and um, the government. The government should come up with institutions. They're the ones to provide the facilities. The teachers teach the concepts. 
while the while the parents teach it, the morals and instill the values. However, when it comes to the what, this is the most important, it is curriculum. Uh, the curriculum I grew up with is called the 844 system. It's like the American system or British system. Now in Kenya, it's the 844 system. The 844 system means that you have eight years in, in a primary school, four years in uh, high school, then another four years in tertiary education. However, in 2019, we only saw that 57% of people in primary school transitioned into, into high school. And yet I belong to the 3.5% of Kenyans with a bachelor's degree. If I choose to do a master's degree, that goes lower to up to even one, lower than 1% of the country. So the issue has always been the curriculum. Now, uh, how do I, what, what is my proposed method? Now, this is where we, I introduced the concept of education pedagogy. Education pedagogy is how teachers teach in school. And I will give credit to credit is due. Kenya this year decided to take a new role into its curriculum. We've completely changed the curriculum to a core-based curriculum. Students are now forced to uh, choose a subject they like and carry on with it all through to high school. So when they're 12, when they're 12, they are taught um, subjects that are not uh, menial like mathematics or science. They go into deep subjects like um, my sister who's currently 12, she's currently doing um, computer literacy and also agriculture. Mm -hmm. So there's a question I wanted to ask. Do you think education should be universal or um, relative? In that question, I, I my conclusion would be the method of teaching should be universal, but the content of what is being taught should be relative. For example, in Kenya, we teach a lot of agricultural subjects because it's what we rely on. We, con we rely heavily on coffee and tea plantations. Therefore, that is what is taught in school. Up, uh, when you're 14 years old, you'll go to a class called agriculture and home science. You will be taught how to farm. You'll be taught how to um, sew a needle, a thread and whatnot. Those are skills that we need. Of course, that does not translate to the Western world where it's not exactly applicable. Now, the traditional methods of learning are often very uh, based on memorization. But this year, th this globalized world needs, needs competency-based skills. So uh, cognitive, um, critical thinking. These are skills I, I as, a, as a victim of the 844 system, the bad system, I have to learn now under the uh, for, uh, future for sustainability leadership that I'm in. I am now learning as a future sustainability how this, these um, skills that I'm learning right now will help me in the future. So uh, how, how does uh, education influence human security? One, in terms of accessibility, lack of early education means illiteracy, and that in itself is a human risk. Secondly, the quality. If um, I don't have the skills to qualify in today's world, I fail. I, yes, I have the mathematical skills, but I do not have the leadership or competency built skills. I will fail in life. And in terms of equity, um, Kenya is struggling so much with gender disparities where men, men are succeeding far way, way more than women. Uh, I'm actually one of the lucky few. And this is, I wouldn't say, uh, culture is the cause of it, but the discrimination invokes impairing of ability to understand the legal rights. I, if I'm not um, taught about my legal rights, I'm not able to exercise them. And how does how can we promote education more universally? Um, I would say in three ways, individually, socially, and globally. Individually, take initiative as yourself. You go teach yourself. Like um, if I change my mindset and want to learn a computer-based skills, if I want to know how to code, I will do it by myself. When it comes to, to community-based, uh, teachers come in and they change the mindset of their children. Allow children not to, do not have that repetitive kind of learning, but instill to them mindset, uh, build creativity in them. In terms of government, I think, 
uh, governments need to sit down with themselves, not as a global, not as a global, but as as a country itself. For example, if Serbia, Serbia needs to sit down, South Korea needs to sell, sit down, Morocco needs to sit down with themselves and evaluate how is their education uh, affecting themselves and what can we do to change it. Um, currently, the, uh, the first kahoot of the CBC program, the one we have in Kenya, is this year. We'll be able to tell the results of how well it does next year. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ashley, for this amazing speech. And now we will move to our final speaker, Hyosup Kim, a student, Korea University Graduate School of International Studies. Kim, could you tell us how is drug abuse related to human security and how can education enhance this matter? Thank you. Here, I'm, uh, today I'm bringing some, like a bit of unique uh, or uh, strange maybe topic relations to education, human security. Uh, really well learned about cybersecurity and, and, and education for uh, girls and boys and the higher, higher education for uh, further uh, uh, public. Here, I'd like to talk briefly about human security and education with regards to uh, uh, drug abuse. With my self-claimed title of education as a great force to protect the youth from the drug abuse. I know drug abuse is not very bright and nice topic, but perhaps you might think it's not relevant to you or people around you, I know. Or drug abuse is merely for the bad or careless guys. Uh, however, it might you might want to reconsider that if you know the drug abuse threat is near to us. It's uh, with your knowledge or without your knowledge. Education, especially to protect human well-being, prosperity for all by avoiding from such unhealthy or dangerous substances. So what I'm saying is that uh, through education, we can ensure human security and human security uh, from drug abuse. Here are some facts. Uh, first, uh, drug abuse has been one of the most serious social problems for many countries. Uh, UN ODC report says the recent trend, uh, trend of drug abuse has been increasing steadily it, it never dropped, it's been increasing throughout the uh, history. The international drug flow was normalized after the big waves of uh, COVID-19. So it was paused uh, uh, during the COVID, but now it's been normalized and it's been prospered more than before. Second, drugs seriously threaten human security across all countries and interdict human development and security because those substances destroy people's mind and bodies. Also, the nature of drugs are so highly linked with the organized crimes and black economy that funds violence and conflicts. So that it can be argued that when you purchase a hint of meth, methamphetamine, you contribute or finance conf conflicts and the violence. Third, it is observed that many drug consumers fall into the age of youth, between 15 to 30. So the, what I'm talking about is me. My, I'm, I'm falling in that actual age. A survey says the average, average between, sorry, average, um, sorry, the age between uh, 13 to 20 uh, fall into the uh, actual drug uh, users. It depends on the uh, type of drug uh, that you're talking about. Uh, I'm actually talking about the youth, like me and you. It's all age human security issue, but it's more young people uh, are, are more and more young people are attracted by drugs, which is a very uh, sad thing. So the usage uh, reflects and differs from the socioeconomic situation in a given country. It depends on why they use and how they use. However, it is universally important to ensure the youth is given accurate, needed information slash knowledge about drug abuse through adequate uh, education slash awareness raising. The awareness raising might sound too obvious and simple, I know, but you might think, who doesn't know about this one? Who You, you might think that everyone knows about the harmfulness of drugs and that uh, we are not supposed to use them, right? But please consider different cultural, educational backgrounds, as well as socioeconomic situations where certain drugs uh, is widely available and cheap in your area, as well as culturally acceptable as recreational. 
right? Please consider the fact that not many people can draw a clear line between narcotic drug or non-drug, okay? Some people accidentally fall into drug abuse due to false information. Some people are drawn due to the peer pressure. So now the question is, we must know how to protect ourselves from drugs, right? In this sense, education can, can enhance this. So I'm suggesting uh, the purpose of education in this sense has two major goals. First, prevention of the usage of the uh, earliest stage, whether it was voluntarily or accidentally. So you are, we are trying to interdict the usage of drugs in the early stage by giving them you know, information that it is actually harmful with statistics. The education should provide exact information about current drugs in the market, side effects, the distribution routes, the forms of drugs, solid, liquid, or alcohol, or without alcohol. Maybe this socially taboo to talk about this one in top public, However, I believe more information available uh, uh, for the public, the higher chance you, you can avoid, right? Second, it is for the, the, uh, the harm reduction uh, for the users, the drug users, and from other collateral medical risks, such as AIDS, HIV. So it is for the ongoing drug users. It is necessary to prevent and reduce the harm to the existing drug users who should be able to give an education about treatment, rehabilitation, as well as the best practices when using drugs, such as basic hygiene principles. We cannot really stop them to uh, use them. Then if we cannot uh, stop them to use them, then we give them uh, basic um, knowledge and information about hygiene principles, right? So that they can prevent uh, further uh, fall to the greater risks. So uh, here I'm suggesting there are some factors that we think uh, we should be aware when promoting the education about drug abuse. First, um, open education. So more public information sharing about drug abuse is, uh, is, 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 is necessary should be done in an objective manner, open to public widely. It shouldn't be stigmatizing or shame-giving to lady drug users. International organizations or NGOs can do the role to make it delivered to schools, universities, or workplaces. Second, culture-changing education. Given the fact that peer pressure works greatly among the youth, when they're entering the uses of drugs, it is important to divert the culture away from drugs, right? For example, the anti-tobacco campaign that provides adequate uh, harmfulness education, let's say in South Korea among schools, that amplifies the, uh, the harmfulness of the cigarettes, that tells that it's not cool, it's not attractive to, to smoke. Not, uh, it's not something that you, you uh, admire. Third, uh, alternative giving education. It must be considered whether the youth is given fair opportunities, alternatives, in order to foster their human security in the first place, rather than solely blaming their drug users. Also, it must be considered whether the uh, youth is given alternative leisure or recreation such as sports, arts, or entertainment, other than drugs. So we are now talking about um, not solely blaming them, but you know, giving them with the alternative through education. So overall, wrapping up my speech, um, simply it shouldn't be the education on drug abuse, shouldn't be, so what education? It is merely that it merely talks about how bad it is, how harmful it is, you're not supposed to do it, you are, uh, it's for the bad guys, it's for the careless guys. It should be able to give and provide what alternatives are out there and what opportunities they are given other than drugs. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Kim, for this eye-opening speech. 
Now I would like to thank all of our speakers today. And for the end of this session, I would like to ask you if any of you would like to share ideas or examples of how youth can stimulate changes in education. Uh, so that was one of the proposals actually for, for youth and for everyone uh, to try and raise a, a multidisciplinary campaign that will kind of uh, put the light on um, access to education for everyone, no matter of uh, their, so it has to be campaign. So you can actually advocate in a different, uh, throughout the social media, throughout all the sorts of uh, catalysts that will uh, contribute to this consciousness and allow everyone to have access to, to education. Uh, so I propose the multidisciplinary youth campaign of education for everyone and notably targeting uh, the, the countries which are facing in concrete the, the problem of discrimination based on um, gender, like in uh, Afghanistan. And there are many different examples uh, in the world. Uh, so um, that is what you you should do. First of all, target uh, existing uh, countries with the existing problems and then try to advocate and uh, to, throughout the different sources of, uh, of influence. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Tamara? Thank you, Dora. Yeah, I wanted to uh, reply to your question. How can we as youth contribute to, to the education? I think we should also be educators, not necessarily in institutions like uh, universities and school, because it's not really possible, but there is uh, thousands of, of ways to be the educators. And I think that's necessary because we have new perspectives uh, because of all the opportunities we had that are that the future generations provided for us and that they didn't have. So um, we're the ones who will shape the future. Uh, so it is necessary to to for other people to hear what we have to say, not only to the generations uh, younger than us, but also uh, to the older ones, because of course of, of the new perspectives and um, yeah, th there is a lot of uh, informal educational plat platforms where you're able to listen to other people, uh, experts, but also youth in the fields of your interest. For example, Youth for Sustainability, which is a program by Mazda, Mazdar, and a few of us here um, are part of that program. Uh, we are the future sustainability leaders. So there we have the opportunity to educate ourselves, gain some new skills, but also after going through the that new education we gain, uh, we can spread, spread the knowledge to um, new people coming into the project. So that's a nice way to spread, spread the word about something you're interested in. That would be it, thank you. Thank you, Tamara. It is very crucial to make a bridge between the decision-making institutions and the youth, so their voice can be heard, definitely. Any additional comments from other speakers? Ashley? Yeah. Uh, as a person from a developing country, Kenya, um, we are very hands-on. In my community, it's a very small village, as I've said. Um, we work as a community. Um, I, I love how uh, Tamara and Hyosab and Ivana all are coming together to like give us a voice and help us. And from, from us, the, no, from the developing countries, we usually work as a community. So um, right across the road from where I am, we have a small library where we donate books. And instead of uh, kids buying new books every year, my, uh, my sister who's currently 12, she donated her books from last year to help the students who are, who are doing it this year. Yeah, at the same way, the older students are also um, mentors for the young kids. Because here um, you'd find a classroom of 77 children over one teacher. 
So that, that there's always one student who's not being catered for. So we always have this uh, mentorship programs that I would like if all of you could uh, be part of where you get a student and mentor them in whatever subject you think you feel like you like or and these are like kids that are like three years old so it's addition subtraction small small um <laughs> educations like that and also prioritizing our education as Tamara said we are uh Kyosab uh, Hamza and I and uh, Tamara are in this Youth for Sustainability program. That's how we use our voice to be heard by the outside audience. So that has helped us a lot. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Ashley. Kim? Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So I just wanted to say um, in extension to interdisciplinary planetary uh, education I'd like to suggest as well intergenerational uh, education as well considering that the um, many uh, drug users are uh, it's uh, it's all age um, uh, problem and then many new drug users are are, are youth as well and I think it is should be as well uh, inter class or inter society education that it must target the public to everyone uh, accessible for information for everyone about the uh, drug and drug. Thank you, Kim. Well, if there are no additional comments, I would like to thank you all for taking part of this amazing, insightful session. And hopefully we got some new ideas and we will actually be able to make an action plan to make a change. So thank you everyone for coming here and joining us today.